Thank you. I would like to begin by greeting our dear Hosanna Hamos coordinating this panel, Giacomo Filibeck, and thank him for his kind words about me and to say something, something very interesting. When I arrived in the Chidadenches prison, where we ended up going, I hope he understands. So when I arrived at the prison, it said on the wall, some prisoner had written, there were about five layers of paint, and it said, happy is the people that has no heroes. And that stayed in my mind, why, why should people not have heroes? It was a kind of uh, a letting off steam. So happy is a people that doesn't have to resist the torture, that doesn't have to res resist restrictions of rights, all the atrocities that, that are committed over the course of history. So therefore, you don't need heroes, right? So. Uh, all the abuses against the poor and the oppressed. Unlike what it seemed, it was a defense of the capacity of each of the people, the anonymous people, of resisting. People are not born resisting. The circumstances, historical circumstances, compel them to resist. And what is happening with all of us? This is something that we share at this moment in a very similar way. Why? Because we are experiencing a moment where all over the world globalization has led to an increase of development of capitalism where finances end up dominating. So the crises have become slower. Uh, when it comes to the recovery. The recovery from crisis has slower. So this has led to the opposite of what happened during the phase of liberal democracy, which is an enormous increase in inequality. And the whole ideology of social mobility in the post-Second World War period is coming apart because of such a rapid increase in inequality globally, particularly because finances, the financial sector, is dominating the economy, leading to a reduction, a dramatic reduction of productive investments therefore compromising also the uh, job creation and opportunities, harming workers, small business people, small uh, farmers, and even those that produce for the domestic market and don't have the dimensions, the scale to transform part of their companies into banks. This process explains this extreme inequality of loss of what you called the hypothesis that always my children will have a better life than I had. This led to a problem regarding democracy itself. So democracy is, seems to be mitigated. We are not uh, witnessing, we're not living through the democratic expansion of the post-war period after the 80s, both with Reagan and Thatcher. There was a change through brutal deregulation of the financial system, changed the conditions under which uh, profits are appropriated. And then you see those 
demonstrations of 1% against the 99. What Oxfam says, the world, the Brazil, the United States, and England, and any other country, an increase, a huge increase in, in the wealth of a very few number of people, and based on papers, treasury bills, bonds, um, and speculation, and reduction of jobs and more precarious work, and work becoming more precarious. This, in a certain way, was mitigated to a certain extent in Latin America by people-oriented governments, because while this process was taking place, we were distributing wealth on the continent, in Argentina, in Brazil, in Uruguay, in various countries, right? Some more than others, but most countries were going through this phase, this stage, which led to the con this process, which led to the 2008 crisis, started demonstrating a major problem because when governments are not able to meet social demands, they become gradually not explicitly, but they, they make part of politics become irrelevant to people. So people identify the lack of capacity of meeting their demands by politics. They identify a deterioration of politics in that. So from the ideological point of view, there also emerges on the cultural point of view, and very much manipulated by the mainstream media, a intensification, a radicalization of the traditional forms of explaining reality, which is to explain it through appearances only, the appearance of things. So it's, it's crazy that the migrants, like the Mexicans or Central American migrants, are, are called to account for the concentration of wealth in the biggest economy in the world, when in fact um, the owners of country, of, of the when the leaders of the business and the concentration of wealth uh, is completely to blame when many people are paid in stock options and so people speculate with their own stocks to raise their own wealth. So even Apple that has more than $800 billion a year of profits, they borrow to be able to speculate with their own stock. Because we know the profitability of third-party capital is always a lesser demand. That is, you can have a lower profitability than what you have with your own capital. So it's a brutal process of income concentration. And then why Trump? Why Brexit? Why the growth of the far right? Well, to a certain extent, we are in a period of transition. I do not think we can explain internationally what Gandhi says, that the new was not born and the dead uh, has not died. It's like the serpent, uh, as uh, old people lose their skin. Today, we have a different skin. It's not the industrial capital. The skin is a financial capital. It's a brand new skin that started to form since the 80s and is now maturing. It's a process. I think we do have a serious problem uh, in liberal democracy. And I agree, liberal democracy to us in the left uh, Latin America parties, it's no 
it's not just liberty of uh, organization. Uh, we, be, we made liberal democracy progressive in itself. And why? Because uh, it does not lose its validity with us. And then two things come up. We have uh, this incapacity to respond at the level of others, the demands of population. And then there is a devaluation of policy, politics. It is the means through which we have to see that the issue of inequality it is a product of people's reactions. I react against uh, migrants. They are taking my employment away. This is my immediate view. It's not the process of the system. It is how I see it. And I think this happens in some demonstrations as well. I'll give you an example. We had uh, a demonstration that is similar to the yellow vests in uh, France, which is a, a demonstration of truck drivers. Indeed, to increase the price of uh, gas by 400% is scandalous. And it turns uh, company owners uh, 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 to a problem. They don't know uh, what their costs are going to be. It's a problem to truck drivers that have their trucks. It's a problem to everyone. But the cause, is it the increase of price? What leads to an increase of price? Well, what leads to an increase of price is the submission of an administration to the interest of a minority that controls the financial shares of uh, Petrobras. And instead of rendering accounts to the collective, renders accounts to a minority. So the demonstration becomes against the increase of the kitchen gas, of oil. In France, it is against uh, taxation. I think it's very important to diversify the energy matrix. But the problem in France is not diversification of energy. It is, like in any European country, the loss of rights that they are trying to impose to workers. And it comes to a point, it's just too much. And when it is too much, there is a movement that comes back and stands out and is transformed and becomes a movement that rejects politics uh, many times. And why? Because the political dequalification process started back then. We went through that. So we have to discuss how we can have, uh, I'm sorry, what forms of democracy are replacing liberal democracy, some call mitigated uh, democracy. Others talk about a state of exception that corrodes democracy from inside. So you have several categories and several manifestations of democracy. Here in Brazil, we have experienced in uh, recent years, since the coup of uh, 216, a process of uh, the building of a new order. Uh, um, I, I don't know what to call it, but I think it is a state of exception, that is, a state that lives together with democracy but corrodes democracy from inside. It's not like a military dictatorship that we have already experienced, where you have a full elimination of rights, the right to, to demonstrate the freedom of press, organization. You have a general loss to everyone in any circumstance. 
this is a military dictatorship or a dictatorship. What is the difference from what we are going through? Why people say it's not a coup? Because a coup evidences and um, discloses, strips a taking an undue taking of power. So they cannot call it coup, because uh, unlike uh, previous coup, remember, um, they seized uh, t uh, the TV or radio communications, and it said, this is how it's going to be from now on. So coups in the past were evident. This one is disguised. A coup to democracy right now is something has to be under a veil. So I will say, we have to have a more extreme democratic fight that matches the emergence of new liberalism. We cannot only be only Democrats. You have to remember that in Brazil, it started with my impeachment, and then it started with, and then went went on with an adoption of national sovereignty and a neoliberal uh, economic practice, and then it culminated with the arrest of Lula because he was going to win the elections. So you have three stages to prepare for a new order. Uh, Lula could not win the elections for a simple fact. The whole system of the coup had to reproduce. If Lula won the election, he would prevent the reproduction to follow. He would prevent uh, Petrobras to be sold, that uh, workers would continue to lose rights because they are saying the labor reform is uh, still incomplete. The passing of the pension reform, the school without parties, the independence of our central bank, and so on. Lula could not win the election, and he was winning the elections. They did everything for him not to win. First, he was uh, prosecuted, then he was convicted, then he was prevented from being a candidate. He was arrested. He was prevented from speak out. And all this process just uh, moves on and uh, gets to its apex in an election. And uh, uh, not all will consider that in Brazil we have uh, a new fascist authoritarianism that uh, raised to power. And why? Because there is an articulation of new liberalism, but there is a component there which is the following. It's no use just to defeat your opponents in an election because, you know, this is the democratic game. You know, part of the democratic game is to run an election and win or lose it. But, you know, just destroy your opponents is not part of the democratic game. And they don't want it. They don't want political opponents. They don't want uh, rights to the population. So this is what is going on in Brazil. And why do I talk about taking democracy more radically, which is the most important thing to us? Because I believe that democracy is uh, uh, taking democracy to the extreme is the way of putting together the populational side of social rights, defending your sovereignty, because in our countries, we have to know where our wealth is going to, where everything we build goes to. And we build in different realms. I'm not talking only about our natural resources or fertile land, but also all the technology we developed to build a medium-sized jet in Embraer. Uh, there is a technology behind that. And now they want to sell 
Those that produced uh, medium-sized jets uh, competed with Bombardier and Boeing, and now they want to sell to Boeing. This is our technology. You can share. I'm not against having partnership, but why sell it away? The same applies to the fact that we are a country that uh, learned and got, expert, uh, got the expertise of uh, exploiting oil in deep um, waters in high temperature. Why do we have to hand in our wells? Oh, Petrobras does not have the money. How come Petrobras does not have the money? Any bank in the world will want to lend money to an oil company. So we are going through times where there's, there's much at stake. And democracy is a way through which we have to manifest ourselves and take things to the limit. It's a whole process of uh, fights. And I think, and I would like to close with that, there is another uh, very important piece of news here, uh, in addition to the emergence of the far right. And I think this is news at the international level. And I'm talking about the so-called new media. I don't think the new media is neutral. Uh, we don't say uh, television or radio uh, communication is neutral. Uh, new media uh, is technology that can be used in different ways. We witnessed in this last election a disruptive aspect of uh, media, and I'll talk about that further on with regards to Brazilian elections. For the same time, those that did not uh, have time uh, in television, didn't, did not uh, uh, debate, could win elections. How come a party that had no time on TV, that did not go to debates, won the election? How come? because there was a new political ground through the new media. In the United States, it was through Facebook. Here, it was WhatsApp. What is disruptive? Disruptive is any technology that enters a system and puts an end to something. I'll give you an example. I am uh, from a time in which we used to that gadget, I don't even remember, remember its name. Instead of watching Netflix or Prime Video, or whatever, we had a tape, a tape. The other day, I saw a vinyl record. I am from the time where I listened to music from vinyl records, uh, children's tales. You are younger than I am. I know technology is disruptive. And what I'm saying is that social media, politically speaking, creates a new ground. In the case of WhatsApp, it's even more complicated because this ground, you have a bilateral relationship. That is, you don't have a collective dialogue and if there is no dialogue then you allow for a level of expansion of a ground in which we were not present and this is going on uh, throughout the world it's not only in Brazil a strong presence of the social media in the process I do believe Taking democracy to an extreme has also to go through the social media as a form of interaction. We need it to be able to expand the process, especially uh, we that in Latin America uh, well, are going to have a difficult time ahead of us. And it's going to be very important to have articulations at different levels. We cannot do away 
a major democratic popular front. Uh, we cannot do away with it. So I would like to close by saying that I think it would be very timely for all movements, parties, organizations, conglomerates to fight uh, for what we call to left in the past, and now it's more uh, in the ground of uh, being progressive. And we have to modernize uh, this ground and make it again a ground that can attract millions of people, youngsters, and workers using this media. We'll have to use it because here in Brazil, workers use the media on strikes. I remember the strikes involving uh, workers from hydropower plants and always as a mechanism for the call of the strike of the truck drivers. The yellow vests did the same. So it's not something that we cannot think is not here to stay. The use of social media in political social movements is here to stay. We either embrace it or we are going to become just bureaucratic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President, for...